take your Bibles tonight and open up with me to the book of Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 tonight, as you turn to Romans chapter 1, last Sunday evening we dealt with the topic of racism, a word that in and of itself indicates that the individual does not have a biblical worldview. Uh, For some reason, the message has stuck with me this week, and I'm still chewing on it. And there's just some extra things that I want to share with you. This is uh, not really a good warm-up for the message for tonight. This is just two separate things. Uh, But this is some of the things we we saw last week. And just to remind you, there is only one race. That's the human race. There is not the African race. There is not the Mexican race. There's not the Chinese race. There's not the French race. There's not the German race. There's not the American race. Those are nationalities. Those are ethnicities. Secondly, we saw that this constant cry in our world, every time you hear somebody uh, screaming the word racism, again, they don't have a biblical worldview because the Bible teaches one race, but the scream is not an attempt to unify, rather it's an act of division. And this constant uh, goad that is used in our nation today to divide, it is being used more and more and more, and we are seeing the division that's created. Uh, Such such tactics will continue to be effective for one simple reason. Man cannot have a good relationship with man until man has the right relationship with God that they ought to have. And so long as humanity, as our, our culture is pushing God out of the way, then we are not going to have a good connection with our fellow man. All cultures, all ethnicities have good and bad in them. I don't care who they are. And uh, if, if I don't like something in your culture, well, that doesn't make me a racist by the world's definition. I just don't like what's in your culture. You know, to be perfectly honest with you, I don't like a lot of stuff that's in white culture. But I'm not racist against white people. I closed the service, and this is actually a misnomer to say that. I closed the service with the song, Jesus Loves the Little Children of the World. Somebody shared with me that Ken Ham, with Answers in Genesis, said that that is a scientifically inaccurate song. Never thought about it that way. But somebody rewrote the lyrics, and I really, really like the lyrics. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Shades of brown from dark to light, all are precious in His sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. I like that. You recognize tonight we all have melanin. Melanin is that, I don't know, chemical or enzyme or whatever in our body produced by melanocytes, and it's what gives the skin its color. Even an albino, what an individual would be called as an albino, why are they that shade of white? And I mean really, really white. You say, well, they don't have any melanin. They have melanocytes. The problem is that there has been something wrong in the genetics that has shut the melanin off. So that's why they don't have the color. But every one of us, every one of us, we've got melanin. I'm not white. There are white shirts sitting out here. That's white. I got color. And it's it's incredibly light brown. But come summer, and some of you, you know, winter comes along and you get to looking like Casper the ghost. Um, But summer comes along and we get outside and we start working in the sun. And you know what happens? The melanocytes start firing and the melanin starts producing and we start darkening up. And we look forward to that summer tan, don't we? Because otherwise you go, oh, boy, you look so sad, you're so white. Nah, it's just winter. We'll get over that as soon as the sun comes out and we get outside. Isn't that a great way to look at it? Why in the world would anybody have anything against somebody else because of the color of their skin or the country that they come from? It makes no sense. We all have the same mom and dad, and that's Adam and Eve. And we can trace it all the way back to the garden. So tonight, like I said, that has nothing to do with tonight. Tonight's message is on sexuality. And you go, oh boy. (laughs) 
Remember that we are taking a look at having a biblical worldview. If we don't have a biblical worldview of sexuality, then there is man's worldview of sexuality. And that's all over the place. I mean, you don't even have to look far to understand what it is, how it is that man views our sexuality. In Romans chapter 1, starting in verse 18, the Bible says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through dishonor, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. We look at a message tonight that I will promise you is absolutely controversial in our world today. I was just reading a book, and it's uh, dealing with how, to, how Christians deal with uh, cancel culture. And our culture, Christians, is being canceled by this world. There was a time, and the author brought out something that I thought was very, very interesting. He went back to the 50s and 60s, and he says, you know, back then, you would say the things that I'm going to say tonight and the vast majority of society agreed with you. They understood exactly where you were coming from. You didn't have to lay background information. They had that information. They had background understanding of what God's Word had to say. And then each generation got a little bit farther and farther and farther away to where now, when the things that will be said tonight are said, we are viewed as individuals who are bigots, individuals who... Um, are opinionated individuals who don't know what they're talking about and all this kind of stuff. We are hated, we are vilified. Our culture as biblical Christians is hated by this world if we stand for the truth of God's Word. Listen, I don't care what the world says. We've got to say what the Bible says. And we've got to stand for what the Bible says, even in a world where it's getting more and more difficult. Let's consider this area of sexuality and the expression of it. In 2001, 53% of respondents to a poll stated they believed that gay or lesbian relations were morally wrong. But in 2020, that number has fallen to 32% that believe that it's morally wrong. 43% of Americans say that pornography is morally acceptable. That number grows every year. 46% say that changing one's gender is morally acceptable. 79% of Americans believe that divorce is morally acceptable. 73% believe premarital sex is morally acceptable. 66% believe that having a baby outside of marriage is morally acceptable. My question is, where in the world are they getting their definition for morality. And you know exactly where they're getting it. They are getting it this way. And so long as their fellow man is in agreement with these things, and you can see the changing uh, of the beliefs, the attitudes, the, the morals that people stood with, as, as long as we get them from here, we get them from each other, it's going to keep getting worse. But when we get our morality from God, that never changes. Because God never changes. And what was immoral then is immoral now. What God has to say then applies to now. It is certainly not the Bible and God where this world is getting their morality from. So how did we as a nation get to where we're at? You know, this supposed Christian nation that we live in, how in the world did we get here? Going back to verse 20 of Romans chapter 1, starts us looking at attacks on our Maker Attacks on our Maker, for the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. What can be known of God has been put within man, because man has been created in the image of God. 
So there is that basic knowledge that is there. When applied to our topic tonight, man knows, because it has been put within his heart, man knows that God has made us in his image. Go with me back, keep a marker here. Go back with me to James chapter 3 and verse 9. James chapter 3, verse 9. In James 3 and verse 9, Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Made after the similitude of God. That's how we have been made. Man knows that. God made us male and female. Do you know what you are tonight? God wasn't confused about our gender. God knew exactly what He was doing, and He made us the way that we are. God made us for marriage, or God made us for singleness. And singleness is a gift. Don't think for a second that it's not. Marriage is a gift. Amen? All right. Singles, singleness is a gift. Amen? Oh, there's more than I thought. All right. Good. What isn't a gift, what we were not made for, was shacking up and playing house. That's not what we were made for. God made marriage for one man, for one woman, for one lifetime. God made us reproducible. And God made the sexual relationship between a husband and a wife. And it's sad that we've got to say it this way. For a a by birth biological male, by birth a biological female. And God made it intending for it to be for one lifetime. And He blessed that marriage bed. Hebrews 13 and verse 5 tells us that marriage is honorable in all things, and the bed undefiled. You know what that says? you got to take the opposite of that. That says that the bed where the sexual relationship is, where marriage isn't, is defiled. There's no other way to look at it. It's defiled. Listen very carefully. Every act of immorality, it is a blatant attack on God. Because God is the one who established that which is moral and that which is immoral. I don't care what the law says. I don't care what some church says. I don't care what your best friend tells you because you're going to seek out somebody that is going to tell you exactly what you want to hear. I'm going to tell you tonight what God says. And every time that you do something that is immoral, every act of immorality in this world, It is not an attack on our fellow man. It is an attack on our maker. It's an attack on God. It's an attack on the one who declared what is right and what is wrong. An attack on our maker. Going back to Romans chapter 1, look at verse 20. Let's talk about an attack on morality. Once God and His Word come under attack regarding morality, it's like a domino effect. If you were to open the history books in America and follow the trends, you're going to see how this has developed, how this has unfolded through the years. In Romans 1 and verse 21, let's go there. The first part of verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful. The first thing that happens when our morality starts going down the tank is a change in our attitude. We don't glorify God. We are not thankful thankful. Look at the history books. Look at how that first Thanksgiving took place. Look at the declarations of Thanksgiving that was given by so many of our our previous presidents and the things that they said. I mean, they weren't some sort of a fluffy, uh, politically correct statement. They were thankfulness to God because God was the one that had provided and made possible all the things that we were able to have here in America. And so you've got all these declarations of thanksgiving. But it seems like we have become a very unthankful society. We're not happy until we have more. And we are willing to go into ridiculous debt to get more. We're willing to do stupid things to get more. We're not thankful for what we've got. We lack contentment. Why do we lack contentment? Because we're not thanking the God that gave us the things that He gave us. So our attitude. The next thing is vain reasoning. In verse 21, neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations. The word imagination literally means the reasoning ability, inward deliberating about what to do. It has became, become vain. It has become something that's useless. David Guzik in the Enduring Word Commentary writes, 
The fact is, once a man rejects the truth of God in Jesus, he will fall for anything foolish and trust far more feeble and fanciful systems than what he rejects from God. Let's take a look at this. Go with me. Keep a marker here. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. We're going to look at several verses here just in an order. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 6. When we think about this vain reasoning, this inward deliberating about things, we see so many people, so many people that are in churches today that get themselves messed up listening to false doctrine, listening to things that they should not be listening to, doing exactly what the Word of God says not to do, it messes them up. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. 1 Timothy 1 and verse 6, it says, From which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling. Isn't that an interesting way to put it? Vain jangling. All this vain philosophy, the, the, the anti-God philosophy, anti-Bible philosophy that's out there, the Lord calls it vain jangling. Go to chapter 6 and verse 20. Chapter 6, verse 20. And it says, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and the oppositions of science falsely so called. Oh, buddy, isn't that today? We have got so much of that going on. Here's the problem, Christian. So many Christians say, well, I'm kind of curious what the other side has to say. Why? What does it matter what the other side has to say? Well, you know, I just, I want to hear their point of view. All right, fit that into verse 20 and tell me how that works out. We are told to avoid it, not entertain it. Because the, when you start entertaining it, it's opened up a door and says, hey, devil, come on in. Walk through my mind. See if you can get me up. No, you can't. And it's, it's playing a game. How many people try to carry on a debate with the devil? And folks, there's not a one of us smart enough to do that. Because the devil knows the Bible better than any of us. Oh, I'm going to debate the devil. That's exactly what people do in verse 20 when they don't avoid profane and vain babblings. They say, I'm going to debate the devil. And the devil's going to win. Let's go to the book of Titus. No, 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy. Chapter 2, verse 16. All right, here's another command. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Again, get away from it. Now let's go to the book of Titus, chapter 1. Look at verse 10. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, specifically they of the circumcision. Chapter 3, verse 9. But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. Avoid, shun, get away from it. Oh no, I want to I wanna debate this person. I want to talk to him. I wanna, I'm going to carry on and blah, 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 blah. I'm strong. I, I'm this and I'm that. Isn't there a warning in Scripture about the person thinking they stand to take heed lest they fall? I would be scared to death to say, I'm strong enough for anything. Bring it on. I know where I stand. I would be scared to death to say that because it is the height of pride to do that. So attitude, vain reasoning, go back to Romans chapter 1. The last part of verse 21 says, and their foolish heart was darkened. Verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. I think that verse is really sad. It's like the light went out. They're in darkness. Their foolish heart was darkened. What light was there? Just closes off. And that individual, as we will see throughout the rest of this, that individual's in for a terrible go of it. The fourth thing is misdirected worship. Verse 23, they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, 
jump to verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. It's very obvious that our world today as a whole worships anything but God. Now, our world is good about talking about spiritual stuff. And again, this book that I was reading on cancel culture and how Christians are to deal with it. Uh, one of the things that it brings out, it says, as long as you say you're a Christian, and as long as you are talking about good character traits, things like that, that's okay. But the minute that you start talking about specific doctrine, like salvation by grace through faith, an eternity in heaven versus an eternity in hell, calling individuals sinners, why, that's offensive. When you start doing that, that's where the world gets angry with you. That's where they start canceling you. The Bible says here that this idolatrous world worships all sorts of things that they can't, that they shouldn't worship. Think about what our world worships today. Our world worships fawns over celebrities, athletes, rock stars, actors and actresses. Self is worshipped, promoted by this whole self-esteem message. Animals are worshipped, treated better than children. Um, I, have you noticed, this bugs me, all right? I'm going to rant for a second. I think the company is Blue Buffalo, but it's one of those that's out there. I don't know. And they have these two individuals. They come together and says, what's your dog eating? And she starts reading off this list of stuff, and you can't make out what it is. And now the dog that gets the Blue Buffalo or whatever the fancy food is starts reading off all these ingredients, you know, like chicken and beef. And, and you know, boy, they're having a steak for supper tonight. Oh, we're so concerned about that. And then the next commercial will be for pizza. It'll be for some, you know, like Hot Pockets, things like that, mac and cheese. Now, I'm not against any of those. Those are good. But I read something over the past week that is in the top 10 foods that you should never eat because they're not good for you. And I know some of you are going, Ooh, pizza? Yep. And I'm thinking, I'm more about the mac and cheese. That, mm, mm. I think mac and cheese is in heaven. I'm pretty sure it has to be. <laughs> but it made this list that it's one of the top 10 foods you should not eat. And yet it is promoted to the children. While the dog, we're going to worry about the content of his food. What did dogs do before we had Purina and before we had Blue Buffalo and all that kind of stuff? They went out and found a carcass and had a snack. Now, that would stop you from letting your dog lick you, wouldn't it? <laughs> oh, but we don't do that anymore because little Fido needs the best there is. But we're going to buy the 99-cent pack of something cheap for the kid. Oh, and we don't even have to talk about putting the kid in the womb. If you was to take, uh, they've been trying to breed pandas in captivity. And they talk about that, I don't know what a panda cub, maybe it's a cub. Um, while it's in the womb, they talk about it like it's a panda. And if you were to go and to shoot the panda, now, of course, you're shooting an endangered species. So strike one, but you also killed the living panda inside. Strike two but yet you can go kill a baby in the womb and no strike. This is where the misdirected worship is at. Our planet is worshiped. It's okay if inflation goes up and the U.S. is plunged into a deep recession and that we don't know if we're going to be able to get out of while the EPA and everything else says, oh, we can't, can't drill our own land. Let's buy it from our enemy. Let's buy it from one of these other goofy countries. And we've got it right here. Oh, but we want to bow to the earth. It's ridiculous. Pleasure is worshipped in America, spending copious amounts on entertainment. People, if the gas prices keep going, I'm going to make a prediction, all right? Don't stone me if I'm wrong, but I'm, I'm not going to be wrong on this. If the gas prices keep going up, it will not affect the ball field in the summer 
but it will affect the church on Sunday. Oh, we don't have money to, to go to the church three times a week. Why, we got to be at that ball field five nights a week. We got to have the kid to practices. We got to do this. We got to do that. Misdirected worship. When this happens, Romans 1.24, just the first six words, wherefore God also gave them up. Them are frightening words. God gave them up. A reprobate mind, verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Robertson's word picture says it's like an old abandoned building, the home of bats and snakes, left to do those things which are not fitting, like the nightclubs of modern cities, the dives, the dens of the underworld, without God and in the darkness of unrestrained animal impulses. God gave people up. And folks, that's where we're at today. We, ha we are seeing a society of people that God has given up. He has given over to some things. Take a look at this. In verse, the last part of verse 24, He gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Verse 26, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. The Lord calls it vile affections, vile passions. The most abominable thing that could be mentioned, I think, is seen right here, the LGBT alphabet soup is a decision made by individuals who made a choice to disregard that which is right. They made a decision to go against what God had placed, their maker had placed within them. They made a choice to ignore God. They made a choice to listen to the vain reasoning of culture, psychiatrists, medical doctors, politicians, preachers, and Hollywood. They made a choice. God says, I'm giving them up. Let them go ahead and worship themselves. Let them go ahead and destroy themselves in the vile affections that we see in our world promoted today. But look at verse 29. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetous, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. Wow, that's, that's an ugly list, wouldn't you say? You see, when you attack your maker, immorality is going to spill out of a life, and you've got all these different expressions of it. For what we're talking about tonight Right smack dab in the midst of all this mess is the word fornication. The word fornication is the Greek word pornea. We get the word pornography from it. But the word means more than just that. Put simply, it's any sexual activity outside of the bonds of marriage. Again, the only place where God blesses the union of a man and a woman. Uh, if we need to be specific, specific and spell it out, we can. Homosexuality bestiality, cohabitation, premarital sex, any form of pornography, affairs, adultery. God says they're vile affections. They are not blessed. They are not beautiful. They are a curse to the individuals practicing them. And, and there's no way to get around this. You say, oh, I want to try to, I want to whitewash, you know, this is somebody, oh, I just love them so much, blah, blah, blah. That's great. Love them. But the truth is, God calls it vile affections, and it's because He gave them up, and they're not paying any attention to God, and they can't say that they are. How bad is this? Verse 32, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, 
but have pleasure in them that do them. They know they're not supposed to be doing it. They know it. And they've chosen to do it anyway. Why? Because people enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season. And the immorality runs rampant. You say, oh, but God sure seems to be blessing their lives and yada, yada, yada. Hey, don't confuse long-suffering with approval. It's not the same thing. Christians tonight, well, actually for anybody, this is not a message of hate. I do not hate those individuals, not in the least. I'm afraid for them. I am afraid for those that have turned their backs on God, turned their backs on what they knew was right, and chose to do that which is inviting God's judgment. I'm afraid for them. And Christian, I hope tonight that's how you feel. You're afraid for them. Because what is in their future is not pretty, is it? talked about that this morning. So you and I as believers in Christ, we need to be taking the gospel to them. And one of the most uh, disgusting things, the individuals that find themselves living in the habitual lifestyle of sin and say, oh, but I'm saved. I'm saved. How do you, how do you base that off of Scripture? Your life is a life of immorality. Your life is going down the path of what Romans 1 says. Oh, but I prayed a prayer. Well, whoop de doo Lots of people pray prayers. Did it change your heart? If nothing changed, and you can see nothing wrong with thumbing your nose at your maker, and what he says is morality, you better think twice about your profession of faith. Christians, a message we've got to get out there and stand for today, it's not going to be a popular one, but we must. But if you're here tonight, you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, I can tell you this, and I hope you realize this tonight, Christians, God can save a murderer, God can save a homosexual, God can save a drunkard, God can save a gambler, God can save an adulterer. God can save anybody. And when God saves that soul, a life's going to change. It's going to change. And we need to be there for that individual. But if you're here tonight, and maybe you're not into those, in this category, but you're still a sinner, still on your way to an eternity in hell, would tonight be the night that you give your heart and life to Jesus? Stand with me, please, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, tonight we are grateful for the truth of God's Word, and even, Lord, when it's hard, we know it's right, and Lord, it's for our own good. That's why you've given us these things. And so we ask tonight, Lord, if there is one here without Jesus, a Savior, that even now, that they would come and allow us to take them aside and introduce them to the Lord Jesus Christ. But as believers, burden our hearts for those whose life is so messed up in these areas that we might be faithful to witness to them and tell them how much God does love them. And we ask it in Jesus' name.